everyone, and welcome to the Jeff Bullish Show. Today, I have with me Addison Wigan. Addison is a best-selling writer, publisher, and filmmaker with nearly three decades of experience in financial publishing. Addison is an American writer, publisher, and filmmaker. He has been covering the financial markets, economy, and politics for three decades. There's a lot of stories in there from the dot-com crash to the GFC and recently the cryptocurrency dilemma. He's an acclaimed New York Times bestselling author. His books include The Demise of the Dollar, just released its third edition, covering the dollar from its bailouts to the pandemic and beyond. He's also the co-author of Bill Bonner of the bestsellers Financial Reckoning Day, Empire of Debt. He wrote the little book of the Shrinking Dollar and the Wild Little Book series. He's also the writer and executive producer of the documentary IOUSA, an expose on the national debt, and shortlisted for an Academy Award in 2008. He lives in Baltimore, Maryland with his family. And Addison's latest project is the Wigan Sessions powered by the Essential Investor in March 2020. He is filming from his homegrown studio in his basement built just before the pandemic hit. Welcome to the show, Addison. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Yeah, Jeff, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's it's good to meet you and I'm, I'm happy to be here. So, Addison, let's wind right back to... Uh, what your interests were growing up, which I think led to where to where you are today. And uh, so I noticed that some of your study areas did a master's in philosophy and so on. Um, where did the interest in sort of like, I suppose, the big question of philosophy, uh, writing and so on, where did that come from? You know, as a teenager, what was, what was of interest to you? Yeah, I... I've thought about that question a lot and I don't know necessarily where it came from. And I've tried to answer that question myself just because I'm curious, but I do remember at an early time when I was trying to figure out what to do with my life as like, even as an early teenager. And I remember thinking, Oh, Hey, I want to be a writer. I had no idea at the time what that would entail or why I was just sort of, uh, enamored with the idea of being a writer and I don't even know where I got that from I grew up in a rural community in New Hampshire and there were writers in my community um, John Irving is a famous writer that that was from the area that I grew up in uh, he wrote a one of his famous books was called Hotel New Hampshire and he wrote another book called Cider House Rules which was about an orchard that my dad ran the pick your own uh, Apple program for in the summertime. So I used to go there and, and help out. But I had no idea what being a writer really was or anything. But I just do, re I do recall having that, that idea. And then so as I made my way through school, I was really interested in other people's lives, people, writers and, uh, and performers and stuff. I actually didn't even make it through high school, like conventional high school. I um, dropped out and for a, a period of a couple of years, I followed the Grateful Dead, the band, the the uh, hippie band, the Grateful Dead. I, I was a couple generations in by that time, but um, I followed them around the country. And I was just, uh, I loved the whole idea of the beat generation and, um, and the Merry Pranksters, Ken Kesey and his whole crew. I read all of the the beat poetry and uh, follow the dead and, and tried to trace the ideas that went through their lyrics and those kinds of things. I, I just spent a lot of time reading and doing things that most people would think are uh, unproductive in life. Um, <laughs> and so I decided that I had to get an education for a while. I was a ski bomb and I, I uh, did a bunch of different things that, that I learned later are what, uh, is referred to by academics as lateral learning. I had a lot of experiences and I was interested in a lot of things, but I did nothing very useful. Um, and then I, when I finally decided to go to school, I read a lot of um, American short fiction. So I was really interested in short stories because I was interested in writing and the technique of it and how to put it together. Uh, but then I was also interested in the snapshots that that authors were capturing about American life mostly that's what I was mostly interested in and uh and I spent four years studying that and the only reason I have a degree in it is because I had to pick a degree at some point I had to leave school 
And they're like, what do you, what's your major? And I just counted up the number of credits that I had taken. And I just happened to have more credits in American short fiction than anything else. So that's, that's how I ended up there. But then, um, I realized that there was a lot more to the world than just, uh, you know, stories about sex and drugs and partying and stuff like that. <laughs> so I, um, I went to graduate school and I, I studied, uh, I saw, I went to a really great program actually. It was called, it's a, it's a program run by St. John's college college and it follows the, um, Western canon. It's from the Greeks until they, when I was going there, they finished somewhere around, um, uh, the 1920s. Um, and they, the, the program was based on the actual works that make up the Western canon, the most important ideas and books and writers of, of the Western uh, tradition. Um, and the way that the program works is that you read the books and the, the authors of the books are the teachers and the people that um, are considered, they're not professors, they're considered tutors and they're not allowed to teach in the discipline that they have their PhDs in. They teach um, only to provide guidance to understand the text that you're reading. So I spent a couple of years reading everything from Greek philosophy to um, uh, the origins of Christian religion and political philosophy, those kinds of um, seminal texts that lead to a lot of the ideas that we just take for granted in Western society now. I've read the original idea as it was published. And uh, and then I just gravitated uh, naturally towards um, economics because as um, storytelling and history and religion and philosophy came together for me, uh, it seemed to, the most natural place that that took place on a daily basis for me at least was um, in the marketplace. Marketplaces where ideas and uh, even the concept of money and what it means and how you take care of your family. Cause I, I was becoming an adult. I got married and started having kids. Like I was trying to understand how all that fit together. So um, economics and even the stock market just fascinated me from that perspective. I didn't study finance or anything like that. I wasn't really interested in numbers. I was decent in math, but I didn't care about numbers. And I, I didn't really care about, um, you know, molecular science or space. I was more interested in human interaction and how people talk to one another and what they do, uh, which makes up the, the better part of the stories that, uh, that are history and that our politics and our uh, economics are all made up of. And I just happened to be fortunate enough while I was working through that process in my own head, I met um, Bill Bonner, who had founded Agora uh, Publishing, which is a which was a financial newsletter company that focused on many of the same ideas, the big ideas of the Western tradition and how they were impacting markets and how people can manage their money in the throes of, he started the company in the 70s. So they were dealing with uh, inflation and, and uh the dollar had just been taken off the gold standard. So a lot of the things that I was already interested in just became the work that I was doing too. They, um, they agreed to pay me to do the work that I had prior, you know, I was paying tuition to learn prior to that. And so um, that was in the early nineties. And I, that's, I was saying to you before we even started talking today that uh, that was, this is really the only job I've ever had. The only thing I've really been interested in um, is trying to tell good stories about how people interact with one another and how they should interpret things like media messages that we get um, and, and how, to, how to navigate your own finances and, or start a business and make something of, of your own productive time. In, in the context of all these other themes that are in, in our uh, society. So in other words, you had almost like a, a suitcase full of ideas and interests such as reading, obviously. You obviously sound like a big reader, were you? Yeah. Well, that's actually a good way of phrasing it. I hadn't 
thought of it that way as I was interested in a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's funny that you say it that way too, because when I first met my wife, I was living out of a backpack and I had um, my bed was a, a sleeping bag. And I, I think it was maybe 21 or something at the time. And I hadn't, I hadn't been in school for a number of years. And uh, that's when I was first getting into school and trying to, I realized that there was some need to have some formal education. And, and, uh, but I had spent a while just sort of walking around and talking to people and living out of a bag. But, uh, but I formulated a lot of the ideas. And then, and then I, I have been fortunate enough to be able to explore those ideas over a, a fairly successful career. I've yeah. had my ups and downs in like any career and, and I've, uh, I've had some really great times and I've also had some pretty, um, you know, not so great times, uh, but mostly from my own doing, like I made good decisions and I made bad decisions, uh, mm -hmm. but through it all, I've been able to pursue the ideas that I'm most passionate about. And, and I think are most useful for me to, um, to try to articulate to other people. Right. So you were telling me before we hit the record button here was uh, that you found your job on a job board or bulletin board um, at yeah. college. Is that correct? Yeah, it's funny because um, I'm sure you have an equivalent story in, in Australia, but it's probably as old as time. But I had the actual quarters in the couch experience where I was trying to get a bus and I didn't have any money in my pocket and my wallet was empty and I had to get on this bus. So my wife and I, we weren't married at the time, but we we actually went through the, the cushions of the couch and found enough money for me to get on a bus. <laughs> and that's when I realized I really needed a job. <laughs> so it wasn't good enough just to go to a school and chase ideas i had to actually do something productive that people were willing to pay me for yeah. so i went to the school bulletin board and um and i found a three by five business card and uh, on it was an offering to become a writer for a publishing company and i really didn't know anything about um publishing or writing or the way the world works at all at the time and uh and I just kind of lucked out. I ended up working directly with Bill. Um, and then there was like a team of writers that were training at the time and a couple of people that were like marketers and uh, trying to figure out the business model. And I was right there uh, in the heart of it without knowing anything. I, it was just a really good sort of trial by fire for me. And um, and the, that the skills and the ideas and stuff that I learned during that time I've relied on ever since, you know, it's just happenstance really, because if I didn't, if I didn't need to get on, I can't even remember. I think I had to go get food. That's why I was looking for money to get on the bus. Um, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't have panicked and gone and looked for a job. So um, <laughs> I just happened to look out and find a good one. So you, um, you said before that, um, you were sort of had this dream of being a writer. You don't even know where that came from. And um, yeah. the job offer was to be a writer. So you learnt on the job effectively, didn't you? Yeah. And so there's a there's a detail that matters because it, it was a job to become a copywriter, which I didn't know. It, I didn't know that job category existed. And I thought copyright at the time meant something to do with like contract law, intellectual property rights, copyright. Like I was thinking in those terms, but it was copywriter in the sense of advertising where you write a copy to sell products. And uh, I didn't even know what that was when I applied, but it was for a publishing company and it had the word writing in it, even though it was uh, spelled differently than I was conceiving of it. And uh, and then they just trained me how to write uh, ad copy to begin with. That's the first thing I learned how to do was write advertising bullets. And it was a long time ago, too. That's another thing that's really interesting to me thinking back is that um, my first day on the job, they gave me a, a legal pad and a pencil. And I was, you know, I was taught how to read 
there was a group of us who were like in a little seminar and we started writing advertising bullets. And that was like the very beginning with a pencil on a piece of paper. Uh, nobody had laptops back then. And, and that was back in the days when in a print a publishing company you would lay all the stuff, you would type it in and then print it out and then cut it in little pieces of paper, lay it on a board, take a picture of it. It was like really old school um, publishing at the time. So I had to learn all of that like from day one and mm -hmm. how to incorporate pictures and express things that um, would attract people's attention and the whole the whole art of advertising is a business and a in a skill set all its own and that's where i started but i gravitated more towards the editorial side which is uh more more explaining economics and history and the markets and whatever the fed's up to that kind of stuff right it took a while to get there, but for, for a number of years, I was uh, trained and worked as a an advertising sales copywriter, right. <laughs> which just makes me laugh these days. But but I do think I learned some good skills, even just in my own writing. I, I always want to make sure my headlines are snappy, my leads are good, and I have a good close and a purpose, good body to the copy. Like yeah. I want to make sure I have all those things, and I learned that from, uh, from writing sales copy. Yeah. Yeah, writing's a very interesting area. And obviously you had this vision of what being a writer was and that must have caught your eye on the job board or the card. So would you call yourself a dreamer? Would that be part of the persona of Addison? Yeah, I would say probably. Um, and I say that with a little bit of... Uh... Uh, trepidation, I guess, because uh, I think part of me dreaming about things that I want to achieve or things that I think could be are part of the reason that I've had difficulties in my career as well. Yeah. So there is a practicality to getting getting stuff done. There's one thing of having the idea. There's another thing of actually getting it on paper. As a writer, you got to get it down. And then there's another thing of actually producing it and then and then uh, having people read it. Like each one of those has its own process. And, yeah. and it doesn't do much good to dream about people reading your stuff if you can't do all the other parts getting up to that point. But yeah. I would say that I, I, I had that kind of dream first without even knowing what the ideas were going to be. <laughs> Which is also a funny way to think about it too but but i do look looking back in all the american short fictions and and even uh my interest in history stories that relate to history i think in all those cases i was interested in in the way that human beings interact with one one another and moving forward to sales copy and then uh and then the kind of writing that i do today um they're all sort of related to one another. They're all modes of communication. And the more sophisticated you are, the more uh, nuanced, the more style you have, uh, the, the easier it is to, uh, to you know, build your own niche in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I've trained a lot of copy copywriters, too. I was a publisher for almost 20 years. And um, as a publisher, one of your roles is to find good talent and train people to do all the tasks that I've been describing, all the things that go into running a successful publishing company. Uh, one of the most important things is um, teaching people how to communicate well. So teaching um different styles and, and ways that uh you use word choice and verbs and you know like there's that's another component to uh to mastering writing is understanding how to communicate to other people how to write yeah <laughs> it you know it doesn't it doesn't shock me that some of the best sellers that we have in in modern times are written by writers stephen king's on writing is is oh. Yeah. Um, a remarkable book and it's also a huge bestseller 
because you know I don't even know how many fiction books he's written, but on writing I think has outpaced all the other books, and it's only you know most of his books are like a thousand pages long, but his book on writing is is a couple hundred pages, and it's phenomenal. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite books. Um, I discovered it about seven or eight years ago, and the yeah. first the first hundred pages is about his story, how he became a writer. And then the next is his toolbox for writing. Um, and our, one of my favourite lines is if um, in it is if see an adverb, kill it. Um, he doesn't. Um, and, yeah. also, and the other thing he talks about in editing, for example, don't edit your own word because it's like killing your own children because you've brought the words yeah. into the world. So as you cannot edit your own stuff much as you think you can, you can't. Yeah, that's one thing I always teach is that every everybody needs an editor, and the, you've got to have thick skin and, and like hand it over to somebody. I work closely with my oldest son right now, and I I feel like he is the teacher when I turn things over to him because I'm like, oh, is it good? Like I I I I need that editor to like come in and and uh, pick out what's good and help phrase headlines and and that kind of thing and everybody needs it. it it's like it's just part of the process that you have to uh you have to embrace it actually you can't you can't just accept it you have to embrace it because it always makes your your stuff better yep. even if the comments that you get this is another thing that i have learned the hard way that even if the comments that you get are wrong and you know that they're wrong they force you to think about whatever it was that you were trying to say or whatever craft you were trying to um employ um it if it doesn't come across even if the the editor is giving you suggestions back that are not as good as what you were thinking it forces you to rethink it because you didn't convey your idea as as well as you should have or thought you could in the first place yeah um, so the whole process of editing that's a like sometimes the first draft is the easiest thing because you just get it down and it's crap and you know it's crap. Uh, you give it to somebody else. They come back with a few ideas. And a lot of times what you end up with after the process of editing is way better, but also not what you set out to do in the first place. Yeah. And that could be anything from a short email all the way to, I think the longest book we, Bill and I wrote together was 600 pages long. So. Mm every everyone needs an editor and everyone needs to like embrace that process your first idea is never your best idea even if you think it is uh it's just a, it's that is the the process that is what you do you engage in the development of the idea and then you embrace the process that brings it out yeah it's um word wrangling is certainly a term i think about a lot in other words you start with this just noise cloud on your head it's just this fluffy idea you put it down on paper and then the job as a writer is basically to make sense of that complexity and distill it into simplicities that would make sense to someone to read it and hopefully inspire them um so that's for me any rate but the other thing that we were talking about before is uh, another person we both admire is who is Joseph Campbell, um, The Hero's Journey, the author of The Hero's Journey. And one of his favourite lines that we discussed before was um, the, the line or sentence, follow your bliss. Now, it seems to me in listening to your stories that you had a dream of being a writer for some strange reason and you started writing. Um, and I love this term by Steven Spielberg. He says that what you should be doing in life will, will, will be a whisper. It will never shout. And in just listening to the story, I'm sort of detecting that possibly that the whisper was this dream of being a writer. And then it's, became louder as you stepped into it is that true like how does how do you see writing now did you find that you just fell in love with words making sense of words getting them out to the world what happened once you started the writing where what was your 
I suppose, thoughts about being a writer. How was how did that develop? Um, that's a really complex question. Probably... <laughs> Sorry, mate, mate, I wrangled that, I mangled that maybe, but. Just... No, but I get where you're going. Um, like, like almost an awareness of, okay, now I'm a writer. I don't think that ever happens. I, I guess that's why I say it's a complex question because every time like, you sit down to do anything, any piece of writing or any kind of creative process, you, you have like that kernel of an idea, the whisper of an idea, and you have to go find it. And so then there's the, the process of going to find it it might be research. It might be something you're trying to prove, or it might be a create or like a vi- not a vision, like an image that you want to get right. And then you like along the way, you learn the ticks and uh, tricks and tools that you use. Like you, you know, uh, I love Hemingway's uh, suggestion that you engage all five senses on every page, and it doesn't matter what type of writing you're doing. It could be advertising. It could be a short story. It could be a uh, historical novel or a, a, a script for a movie. Like you should always be engaging the senses because that's another way of all the senses of the way that we communicate together. So you have like whatever that kernel of an idea is, and then you go and you try to um, use the tools that you've amassed over time to, to, um, to get there, but you're never there. That's the thing. <laughs> it's like, you're never at the point where it's good. Uh, at least I have never am. Even uh, most of the stuff that I've written that gets published is because there was a deadline and I had to get it done. And I, at some point I had to step away and say, uh, that's enough. I'm, I'm actually putting the onus on somebody else because I'm, you know, I'm late on my deadline or um, I know that if I tinker with this too long, I'm thinking right now of a daily deadline. If I tinker with it too long, then we're going to miss all the other deadlines. Like, Mm. I don't ever feel like whatever I'm working on, whatever idea I am, is complete. And then as soon as it's published, I find stuff that would make it better immediately. Like, it happens. It's it's kind of like that phenomenon where you buy a new car and then like what we bought, I remember this vividly, we bought a Range Rover one time and then suddenly the exact model of Range Rover was like around every corner. I was like, what? I've never even, I've never even seen these cars before. Um, I think that's what happens. Like you're on, on an idea and you're so buried in it and, and then you publish it. And then like two minutes later, somebody else had the same idea, but it's way better. And I'm like, Oh, <laughs> it happens it happens all the time so i don't know if there's like this grand moment where where i ever even said i'm a writer although i do recognize that my i've been doing it long enough now when people ask me what i do instead of trying to explain what i do i just say i'm a writer mm-hmm. <laughs> so i don't know if that if that is anywhere near the idea that i had you know whatever 30 years ago 40 years yeah. ago but, yeah. but I do recognize pieces. And, and I also think there's a huge amount of value and experience, like having gone through the paces and learning um, from other people. Studying the art and the craft of it itself is important. And that's not something that anyone can teach. You have to be willing and interested in doing it yourself because um, you don't know. Nobody can tell you what is going to be an important tool for you or an important idea to follow like you have to go and do that yourself and yeah. and it's like the i don't know what adage that is it's probably a proverb by now but there's always going to be better people than you and there's always going to be worse people than you so anytime i am really excited about an idea and i get it done i always find that there are a bunch of other people that already have that idea and some do it better some don't do it as well and uh that, that's just part of it. Yeah. You, you describe you start part of your writing is going, look, um, about just you need to get it out there and you are never perfect with your writing. And that's, of course, that's true. But as a writer or creator, writers are creators, is that um, you got to get to a point where you hit the publish button it's and then release it into the world. Um, that's really important. And... Uh, and that reminds me of the quote, I can't remember who said it, but perfection is the enemy of the good. And we yes. really need 
we really need to get our art out into the world. And there's three sort of steps to that. Number one, idea. The idea is first. Creating is second. But then you've got to share it, publish it, and then you've got to share it with the world because you don't know whether that idea is good, bad, or ugly, and it could be all of the above. So, and so do you have this struggle with perfection still today? Yeah. And I, I, it, it happens in the weirdest times. Like, I don't know that it's happening. And I, and I have an idea that I'm trying to convey. And then, then the deadline hits, for example. And then I look back at it and I'm like, that's not what I was trying to say at all, but we already published it. Yeah. So there's like something that I was trying to get to that, that I didn't achieve. So that that's just annoying at that point. Like, oh, I just didn't nail it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the way I would describe perfection is like you have an idea that you weren't able to, to right. achieve. Yeah. But I do, I think it's important while we're talking about this, this is just sort of a process of getting stuff out the door. There's two things. One, uh, I really do enjoy the crafting. Like you were talking about the word jumble and, and figuring out the right words to put it together. I, I, I entertain myself <laughs> by, um, by selecting what I think are the right words. So I'm, a lot of times I'm sort of in my own world writing, thinking, oh, I would like to read this. I'd like, I'd like the way this is phrased. Um, and I, and I probably inherited some of that from Bill, who was my writing partner for a long time. At one time we were having lunch together and he said, he said, I was in the, because he's he was a successful publisher he's the world traveler he's a deep thinker it's like a lot of people he's known for a lot of things um but he he one time he just said this one phrase that i just i think kind of sums it up and he's like you know, people, what people don't realize about me is that i'm really just a crafter of phrases <laughs> <laughs> but in order to get to the crafting of the phrase you have to have all these other pieces that that allow you to the phrase in a way yeah. that that you feel comfortable publishing yeah i don't know it it that sort of uh, that was like a weight off my shoulders actually you don't have to be smart you don't have to have the best idea because you never will um you don't have to be witty or any of those things you just have to chase the idea that you think is most important at that time and do the best you can yeah and uh and and, and then enjoy the process yeah. so that was the first thing it, it, enjoying the process is really important to me because yes. i actually entertain myself by doing it and then when when it's painful when i can't do it and i know that i have to get it done that's when i realize i don't have the idea that that I'm like doing the work for somebody else at that point. I'm either trying to express something that I heard that I thought somebody would want to hear, or I'm trying to meet a deadline that I don't agree with, or there's something else going on. If I'm, if I'm not enjoying the process, then, then there's something broken in the process that that's making it um, not yeah. as enjoyable. Yep. Um, but then the other part, I think you also raised, which I, which, which is vital to the entire thing, is the definition of a writer is that they have readers, and so you have to get it out in the world. Then you have to be your own best advocate. Once you get it out there, um, you have to know how to market yourself. You have to know how to talk to people in a way that interests them in the work that you're doing or the thought process that you have. You you have to have all of those things working at the same time because everybody has a brain we all know how to write not everyone knows how to write but um we all know use language to communicate with each other it's important that you understand how all the pieces fit together in order to make it a productive enterprise that people want to engage in yeah there's like a lot that goes into it and yep. uh, it, it's a study you have, and it changes too with the we were talking about setting up a studio in my basement. Um, I had no interest in podcasting or anything like that until the pandemic hit. Um, and then it was the most efficient way for me to stay in touch with the editors and the thinkers that I, that I got inspiration from. And so I started my own uh, thing, the Wigan sessions where I just interviewed people from my own network of uh, publishers and thinkers 
and then realized that a lot of the conversations we were having would be useful to other people too, readers or people that didn't even know who we were, that we, if we we're having this conversation and you were trying to be a writer, this would be a useful conversation to hear. Um, but in order to do a podcast and like figure it out, there's a whole business that's involved in like learning the um, camera. Like I don't even know the camera yet. It's a 4K. I do know that. <laughs> but um, like all the details that go into actually putting up the studio, I had to learn all that stuff. So uh, and that, that's just part of the communication process that we live in the era that we live in. Hmm. Um, but I think it's really important that you embrace that too everything changes all the time there is no perfection that's probably the best best answer to that whole segment we've just talked about is that you might have an idea of how things are going to go but it never goes that way and that it even when you nail it and you feel really good about something um the environment into which you're putting your ideas and trying to craft them changes and you have to learn new skills and new, new ways of communicating yeah yeah, I think what intrigues me is the art of communication with words. Uh, I'd love the craft of word wrangling, phrase wrangling, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I don't know where I heard it from, but uh, what I'm very cognizant of all the time is the job of the headline is to get people to read the first line. The job of the first line is to get people to read the second line. The job of the second line is to get people to read the third line. And um, it, so that, that I suppose, for me, it crystallises my thinking in that will, if I, once they've read that, will they want to read the next line? Is it is it short enough? Um, is it got enough? Is it telling them something they don't know? Um, so I don't know if you've heard of the... There's a writing philosophy done by Axios, the company, started only back in 2018. It's called Smart Brevity. It's the right of writing with brevity that tells people what they know right up front. Have you come across them at all? I, I'm aware of them, and I, uh, my own consumption of stuff online, I get articles uh, published by them sent to me frequently. Mm-hmm. Um I wasn't aware of of what you call it smart brevity, but um, but that makes sense to me because we with one of the things that we try to teach people, especially new writers that come in from an academic environment, is to get rid of adverbs like Campbell. I mean, uh, uh, Stephen King. King would suggest with an L Y is immediately suspect. Uh, <laughs> adjective. <laughs> uh adjectives are often not necessary either i mean that's that's shocking to most people you, you don't need you you adjectives should addict adjectives should be used uh strategically not as part of language otherwise it, it turns uh flowery um cliche. but we try to teach them. yeah cliches are awful uh which I have debates about cliches all the time. I don't understand why people don't understand why you shouldn't use cliches. We can talk about that separately. <laughs> but one of the rules that we try to impart on the writers that we train is um, your sentences should be between eight and 11 words long. Yeah. And to tell that to a new writer who thinks that they're pretty good coming out of school and uh try to get them to write eight to to 11 words per sentence. Um, They just don't believe you. Yeah. They're like, that's not possible. It's not good writing. There's all these reasons why you shouldn't do that. But um, that's another reason I brought up Hemingway earlier. He's talking about engaging all the senses. He, he was a journalist. He started writing war stories on napkins um and brevity was his tool he's probably the master of it at least in american fiction um and and the the, uh just the audacity of trying to express like very complex ideas with a sparing number of words uh is it's impressive Mm. um, to see somebody that can handle it as well as as Hemingway or any of the right, like the war journalists that you read, not not necessarily these days, but um, from like the, the 30s and 40s, 50s, 
um, there was like an era of American journalism where they practiced that that sort of terse, direct uh, prose. Um, it's just uh, it's remarkable. Something I straight <laughs> strive for, but I'm not very good at. Yeah, I, I think the other thing that I discovered along the way, and I'm interested in your thoughts, is, um, and I think Stephen King might have talked about it. I don't know if it was him or not, um, but the rhythm of writing. Um, and I've experimented with it to actually use one word sentences, five word sentences, eight word sentences. But as you've talked about and mentioned is that the importance of keeping it, you know, sentences short. Um, how do you feel about, what do you think about the rhythm of writing? Is it something that you're aware of and, and matters to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the, the, you can do a lot with rhythm, actually. Um, yes. So we're talking about sparsity of words and economy of sentences or words within sentences. I think that's really important. But you can also use um, block quotes and and um, like uh, train. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, like if a character is just thinking. But not really uh, editing themselves. You can you can use you you can make sentences longer and more difficult to read on purpose. Like that's the rhythm of, of like you can set it up and then and then uh, and then use the opposite to your advantage. Yeah. And I do think that you're mentioning a headline should get you to the first line and then and so on. Um, you can also do that like paragraph by paragraph. You can do yes. it chapter by chapter. You can do it. You can structure things so that you're engaging uh, the reader to go along the journey with you, really. Um, yep. And yep. the rhythm is really important to doing that. If yep. it's really tense and, uh, and dramatic, um, your sentences want to be short and punchy and and. You know, you want to be able to express things like uh, anxiety or anger or whatever. Those are all short and punchy. But if you want to talk about, uh, you know, more emotional things like love or loss or, or things like that, you can you have a lot more latitude and a lot more space. Uh, your, your sentences can be longer and the word choice can be way different, too. Yeah. I think all of those things are nuances like. I've never been a painter other than painting houses, which I get a lot of. Um, okay. But like, I understand at least the philosophy of painting, like brush strokes and color choice and texture on the canvas and those kinds of things. And the actual, um, whether you use oil or watercolor or whatever, that's the way I think about writing too, is that you have all of these tools and they're all words, but they're you can you can build in layers of uh, of texture into the writing. Yep. And and rhythm is part of it. It's like the musical part. I wrote I was doing a critique of the one of the Fed um, Fed interest rate. They chose to pause. I think it was in mid-September they paused their rate hikes and I did the entire thing in imagining rock the Casbah by the crack, <laughs> the clash in my head. So each sentence, I tried to make it sound like as if you were singing um, rock the Casbah. Yeah. Actually, you know what it was? This is, this is kind of weird because I only noticed it afterwards. It, I wrote that on October 8th, which was one day after um, Hamas attacked Israel, right? And I wrote a piece called "Rock the Casbah," and I only looked, I looked at it like a month later, and I'm like, "That is weird." <laughs> like, something was happening on that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the other thing that I've had some fun experimenting with is not only just rhythm in terms of just the writing, but the visual rhythm of writing in terms of almost like you end up with a single word at the end of multiple words and almost goes down cascades. So there's a visual rhythm to writing. And I've played with that just for fun um, because I just, 
if you can make it visually interesting, I think, whereas if you look at a wall of text, you're going, oh, my God, yeah. this, I, you feel like running for the hills as a reader, right? Um, I do. Um, but if you break it up, and, and it's also the art of simplification, but for me is experimenting with visual um, rhythm of presenting a story. I've played with that a bit. Um, look, I it ebbs and flows, but that's what I sometimes do. Yeah, I do that a little bit too, and uh, I'm aware of it because I I have raised three kids through elementary and then high school writing before they head off to college, and I've just used everything that I've learned about writing to help them learn mm -hmm. first that it is a craft and you have to study it. You're not just a good writer or a bad writer. You have to actually want to learn it and you have yes. to figure it out. And then there's some easy tools to teach um, younger writers, like younger, younger, like eight-year-olds. You need a five-paragraph uh, essay. You have to have a lead sentence, that, and then you have to follow it up with your support. And then the three paragraphs support the opening paragraph. And then you need a conclusion. Like, you can teach the structure, but then... Um, in all of my writing, I break all those rules all the time. <laughs> yeah. And and I do it on purpose because uh, because of what you're talking about, like making it visually attractive. Like I don't want, uh, like if I, one of the mediums that I write in is a daily email, I don't want you to open my email and see um, an entire block of text that goes below the fold on your computer screen because I want you to be engaged in, in what I have to say. So I, I'll, I'll break up paragraphs and, and things like that based on whatever the content is, but then how it's going to vi visually be uh, appear when it, when you open the email. Yeah. And I think that's important too. That's like an aesthetic part of it. Um, yes. That goes beyond the, the words themselves. Yep. And a lot of times like this, I would never teach a kid writing for school to do this. But if I really want to make a point, even if it's in the middle of a paragraph, I'll just break the paragraph apart and leave yeah. that sentence on its own. So if you're like scrolling down, then um, then I know for a fact that you read at least that sentence. Yeah. And that's a, a way of guiding. Another thing, too, I learned this also from writing sales copy is that you can break up paragraphs and chapters and whatever uh, with subheads, so you can have titles, subheads, you can use quotes or pull quotes, um, so that you, even if you have a longer piece of text that's like 10 pages, you can read it in like three minutes because I've broken it up with the different headlines that tell the story on a flip through. That's what I imagine it's like, uh, you know, reading through a newspaper and you're just reading headlines and then you go back and read the fuller story for the, the the parts that you're actually interested in. Yep. But if you flip through and look at all the headlines or subheads or pull quotes or like captions or pictures that I've put in, um, all of those things help tell the story to someone who's just um, sort of glancing, not actually yeah, scanning. scanning. Uh, yeah. Totally yeah. 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 I, I think, uh, technology and devices have also changed um how we need to think as writers for me any rate in that uh during the pandemic i started writing uh poetry on my notes app on my iphone and what's really good about that for me was there's good to work with constraint because the iphone's a certain size and you only fit a certain words across a line so <clears throat> I found that writing on my phone, um, you really got to take make that every word counts almost by that constraint, and every sentence really counts because you're constrained by physicality and size of the phone. Um, be interested in your thoughts on that in terms of constraints um, for writing. So, do you? And the other thing, maybe I haven't need to look at again is. If someone's because most people are now reading on their phones, yeah. I mean, so your thoughts that on kind that? Of bothers, that that bothers me more than anything um, because I don't like to think of writing to the space. 
so if I know that somebody's going to be reading it on the phone, I don't want it to be to change the okay. um, the sort of the research or the depth of the idea or whatever I'm working on. I'd rather get that figured out first and then worry oh, yeah. about the presentation. Yep. Oh yeah. And so I the constraints are uh there to me they're they're impediments to the creative process, not necessarily um helpful. Okay. Yeah. I, so I, I, I I'm trying not to use the word they annoy me, but that's really what <laughs> that is fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, I, I think as right as this, but the creative process is actually breaking the rules. Um and rules get in the way of the creative process. Like you said, you teach your kids this is how you do a five paragraph paper, for example, and then you go and break all the rules next time you write. Um so um for me listening to you and um and our conversation about writing is that and it's a term we talked about before and I've mentioned already. Um, how important, and you said that at the end of every podcast session that you run, you say, follow your bliss. How important is following your bliss, you believe, in life? And I'm interested in your thoughts because this is a term raised by Joseph Campbell, which was at the core of what he did. He followed his bliss no matter what. Um, Tell me about your yeah, well, and thoughts on following your bliss. Yeah, I think that you can't really be successful over the long term unless you do follow your bliss. You can have short term success. You can you can figure out what what you want to achieve and work towards that. But if it's not in line with whatever your bliss might be, and that's why it's a, a tough phrase to nail down, and you kind of have to embrace Campbell's entire philosophy of writing and, and the, the way he ties it into um, myths and legends and the way that humans have communicated with, with, with each other culturally over time. I think it's all part of a package, but follow your bliss is, is like a feeling like if you're, if you're following your bliss, then you're moving along the right path which sounds um, mystical, but it's not really. It's like, are you, are you doing the right thing at the right time? So if I'm following an idea that I think is important in writing and, I, and, and it's clicking and I'm able to do some wordsmithing and I'm excited about it, then I know that I'm on the right path. Um, even if it's just a short piece or if it's a longer piece, I know that, that I'm getting to where I want to go. Um, it's like a, athletes call it being in the zone like you know yeah. when you're when you're in the right place and doing the right stuff um and to me that's that's akin to following your bliss like try to figure out what that is it's more of a feeling than it is an intellectual concept it's not it's not like a reasonable thing it's more like something that you feel yeah. and i don't think you can be successful for 30 years 40 years your life unless you're doing that i don't think you can be successful in any parts of your life um you know your relationships with other people or where you live or whatever unless you're if you're unless you're following that you may not always have it and you probably won't it's like chasing perfection you probably won't always have it yep but at least you're on the way to to getting it and that's what it means to me and that's just from reading it and thinking about it and then uh like looking at my own processes looking back on the things that worked and the things that didn't and then and then trying to understand how i might make it easier in the future and that that feeling of following your bliss um is is like a state of mind that you're in when when you're doing something that you know you're going to be proud of and that you want to share with people because that's part of the process. Yeah. Um, you gotta you gotta be in that zone over a long period of time. You can not be in that zone for short periods of time. Um, that's usually what happens when you're training, like you're an apprentice or like someone's trying to teach you something. You're you're doing something because you're doing it for because you were told to do it or to achieve, like when you're going for a degree, I 
uh, I don't know why we subject our kids to this. We make them go and get degrees from school. And I did the same, but um, most of what you do in school is you do a bunch of a series of tasks that are not related to anything that you're interested in. Yeah. <laughs> and you're doing it just to get that degree at the end. And so you can do it for short periods of time, but um, yeah. most successful people just blow that stuff off and go and follow their bliss. They figure out what it is that they want to achieve and, and go for it. Yeah, it's, um, I think you mentioned something important. If you're going to do something for a long time and it's not your bliss, uh, it's going to be very hard to stick to because it's not something that drives or motivates you from within. And uh, it doesn't mean the journey is going to be uh, easy, but I think if you're going to play the long game um, and you've been in the game now for 30 years of writing and publishing, uh, you wouldn't have stuck it out unless you really loved it and you were following your bliss, would you? Well, it also has an alternative um, purpose too, which is when you're not, it it's not fun. Like all the mistakes that I've made along the way are because um, I was not, I hate to keep repeating the phrase if I'm trying to just dis describe it. That's a, that's the cardinal rule in uh, our cardinal sin in writing is don't use the <laughs> the word that you're trying to describe in its definition, but if you're not following your bliss, then then it doesn't it doesn't work. Like that's all the times that I look back on when things broke or I wasn't able to achieve what I set out to do or I wasn't able to nail the concept that I wanted to write about or whatever. It's all I can look back. It doesn't always it's not always I'm not always aware of it when it's happening. But I can look back and be like I wasn't even close to where I should have been going, and mm -hmm. that that's an example of like a negative bliss, the opposite of following your bliss, is you're stuck in some anti bliss. <laughs> yeah, I do like anti bliss. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Um, I stumbled into writing over the age of fifty when I started the blog on because I was curious, and I think it's important that we as writers and as yeah, creators curious. need to be curious. And I was just curious about social media rising back in 2008. And uh, I'm still very curious about it. Now I'm very curious about the next generation of technology and its intersection with humanity, which is the role of AI and humans and the tension between those. And I think as creators, Will AI remove our creativity? Will it amplify our creativity? Um, and I think there's a lot of creators, whether it be you know photographers, artists, writers, filmmakers. I think there's a lot of questions being asked about the role of AI and its intersection with being what it means to be human. I'd be interested in what your thoughts are on that, if uh, you've considered that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I have, I'm curious about the topic. So I've read uh, a fair amount of it. I read it. Well, I think most of what I've read about it is the implementation of AI in the business world. Like, how do we use it in publishing, and how how are the company like all the stuff that uh, OpenAI is going through with firing Sam Altman and then hiring him back and. Like I'm interested in the intricacies of the business world uh, and the writer strike that was going on in Hollywood, and also the actors too. The the fear that is that is um, coming because it's an introduction of a new technology into a mm -hmm. fairly defined space. Um, so I'm interested in it, and I've used it myself too. A lot of times, what I'll do is I'll pull up the Bard or Chat. GPT when I'm trying to figure out a concept that I'm not that I haven't done enough research on yet. Yep. I'll key in some questions and then see what it says. And I think it at least on, on that front, as far as doing research and stuff, it might be good for putting together a uh, resume or putting together a, um, a paper for college or something like that. But it, there's no nuance. Yes. in it and there's no like there's no humanity in the in the writing that comes back to you and i've also noticed that a lot of times i already know more than what it gives back to me and so 
it's it's sort of incomplete in that way but that doesn't mean i mean it's a learning technology so that it's going to outpace us at some point Mm -hmm. um so that's just a long really long way of saying i'm interested in i'm trying to use it myself um but but i don't really have an opinion on whether it's good or bad but i do think just from studying history and looking at the introduction of technologies in the past they always come with this level of fear yes and um going all the way back to uh, Adam Smith and the pin makers, um, his famous example from Wealth of Nations where the Luddites came in and destroyed the um, the machines that made the pins. Like every new adaptation of technology to the way that we conduct our business in society comes with this level of fear because it, especially with something like AI, the the speed at which things change uh, is beyond our comprehension. And we don't know what it's going to mean. Just look at what AI did in the marketplace in the year of 2023. It, um, the companies that were formed in 2019 and 2020 became trillion dollar companies uh, in a few short years, we used to marvel at the fact that Google or Yahoo was first, but then Google and then Facebook, they became, and Apple, they became massive companies quickly, but that was a 10 year uh, span. And prior to that, it was, uh, you know, automobile companies grew quickly, but it was a 50 year span. Mm. Each time new technology is introduced into the marketplace anyway, um, there's a level of fear that the future people thought that they could count on because their their own livelihoods were based on a fixed set of ideas. Mm-hmm. Um, throw new technology into the mix, shortcut that, the economics that support those fixed set of ideas, and you get you get a wave of fear and, and yep. Uh, yep. I think we're going through that really quickly right now. And it's usually commensurate with uh, some kind of dislocation in the economy itself. Like we're, we've just experienced uh, almost two years of pretty rampant uh, inflation and the changes that are being brought in by um AI and high frequency trading and the things that are actually happening in the marketplace are outpacing our imagination to to figure out what what could be coming next. Yeah. Which I find fascinating and I want to be able to use it. I do think there's going to be an explosion of creativity. I'm a writer and I want AI to help me write because if I can um you know like I imagine myself going to the library in the mid 90s because i wanted to research um the i don't know the history of dna i used to have to drive to the library and then go to the microfiche thing and scroll through newspapers until i found what i was looking for and it took hours and hours and hours days even to find anything that was useful now i can literally i can if we fast forward all the way to chat GPT, I can key in a question about the history of DNA, find everything I need and forget about it in like 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the explosion of creativity is going to, is going to be amazing. And I think we should embrace it. Mm -hmm. Um, I am a little bit worried. I don't know. Maybe it's because I I was a Terminator fan once, but I am worried about what happens when computer systems get attached to weapon systems. And yeah. and we already know that people make bad decisions when we go to war in the first place. If they if that gets out of hand, that I mean that's the end of civilization in my opinion. Yeah, that's so that's, that's kind of scary. That is that is very scary. The weaponization essentially of AI to um create autonomous decision making and and weapons of destruction and i think nobel started the nobel peace prize because um his technology of gunpowder or well of explosives uh was originally done to you know do mining but it was turned into industrial killing with wars so yeah. um, 
So any technology is going to cut. Uh, I, think it, I think it goes hand in hand. We're going to see both. That's right. So yeah. we see explosion of creativity, but we're also going to see an explosion of destruction as well. Yeah. I mean, history tells yeah. that story over and over again. I think, and I think that's a good segue. Let's chat about your books um, before we wrap it up. So the one that interests me in your books is the demise of the dollar. So you've become a financial writer over the decades. Um, so yeah, this one. So this demise of the dollar. I'm just holding it up in case anybody's actually yeah. watching still. <laughs> uh, this is in its third edition, and uh, I actually wrote. I think the first draft was in, or the first published version was in 2005. And I was curious in um, the relationship we, between the US dollar and the rest of the world currencies, because I was writing about financial markets and its relationship to gold. Um, so there's a history in here of the found, founding of the Bretton Woods exchange rate system, which replaced the pound, uh, the US dollar replaced the pound as the reserve currency of the world in 1944, effectively as the result of a conference that people got together and said, okay, we're not gonna use the pound anymore, we're gonna use the dollar. And the dollar itself will be backed by gold. And then anybody else who wants to use uh, use the dollar for unilateral exchange trade uh, between other countries like Britain and. South Africa or something, they can use the dollar, but if they want to redeem it for gold, it has to go through what was then known as the gold window. Um, they would have to exchange it through uh, the United States. Um, only The only currency from 1944 until 1971 that was convertible into gold was the US dollar. And during that period, we had a massive uh, explosion of prosperity that that followed World War II um, and our, the financial structure of the global economy was developed around the US dollar and it's pegged to gold up until 1971. In 1971, um, the, actually part of the reason that the dollar was convertible into gold is because at the end of World War II, um, the, U.S. had almost 70% of the world's gold reserves. They, they they won the war and they got all the gold. The golden rule is if you have the gold, you make the rules. Exactly. Um, so that's how we ended up in that position. But by 1971, the, a lot of other countries were looking at the, the books of the U.S. government. We were going through um, the Johnson era, great society spending. We were fighting a war in... Vietnam, uh, and so were our allies. Australia was there with us. And we were spending more money than we were taking in in, in tax receipts and were able to raise in the bond markets. So people like France notably wanted to redeem all of its dollar reserves, world reserve currency for gold. So they, they were actually, the outflows of gold leading up to 1971 were eventually just going to erode uh, the amount of reserves the U.S. held in gold at all. Um, so they had to close the gold window. It's, it's, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the basic story. Since 1971, when the Great Bretton Woods exchange rate system was taken down, the, the world has been on, still on a reserve currency uh, backed by the U.S. dollar, but the U.S. dollar is no longer backed by gold. It's backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, which created an era that we're still living in that's known as a fiat era, meaning that it's uh, the value of the currency that we all use um, is, is based on uh, government decree, the confidence that the government can meet its bills. Um, so it's a history. The book is really just a history of how that happened. And then the period between, because I uh, just finished the update uh, earlier this year, uh, the period between 2005 and our most recent bout with uh, inflation in 2022 and 2023 is all covered as a result of the Federal Reserve, the central bank uh, trying to manage 
um, the world reserve currency on a fiat basis. And it's, it's pretty easy to understand once you sort of wrap your head around it, but there's a lot of people that read about this for the first time and they have no idea that the money that they're, that are, is in their wallet. And that goes for Australian dollars or Japanese yen or, uh, European, uh, euros. It's all backed just by government decree. It doesn't have any intrinsic value. There's nothing backing it really. Um, and that's a shocker for a lot of people. It also allows the massive rise in debt that all of our societies um, incur at all levels, at government, corporate, and and uh, individual and family levels. We all manage debt rather than savings and investment. Um, so it's kind of a whole story of how we got there and then what we can expect. It was interesting doing the update to it this year because between 2005 and 2015, the tense was, this is going to cause inflation. Inflation will happen. Like the, the tense of the book was all forecasting. But, but as I was doing the update this year, it was I was changing the tense of a lot of sentences from, this is going to happen to, this is what happened. <laughs> So in a way that was sort of gratifying because we got the story right. But then at the same time, it was like, we've been talking about this for a long time and uh, it's still shocking to a lot of people to just even make that discovery. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one. And then the other one, this is a, this is a parallel book to it. And I'll just bring it up <laughs> is um, a book. It, it's also consistent with, um, trying to understand fiat currencies. This one is a study of booms and busts throughout history. We started this investigation during the credit, uh, the dot com bubble in 2000, and just the kind of crazy investment decisions that people were making during that time, where they're investing in companies that would throw up a website. And since websites were a new technology being introduced into the marketplace, uh, nobody knew what the value of them was so they were bidding up companies I my, one of my favorite stories it's in the book too is of corning that made fiberglass they put a dot com on the end it became corning.com and they started selling fiber optic cable to um worldcom because they were uh putting cable between the united states and uh the u.s i mean in europe under the atlantic ocean and um Corning, which had been a most of their core business, I think even to this day, it was insulation for homes, um, just went through the roof in the stock market because people thought that they had discovered some new business plan. Um, and they're still in business. They still make in insulation. But that boom and bust era was a feature of effectively free money, um, fiat money going into the system and then people not knowing what the outcome is going to be. Mm -hmm. um, the corollary to that is uh, what we have experienced with the introduction of cryptocurrencies into the market. I actually deal with cryptocurrencies in both books because one, it's a, it's uh, by many, the, the crypto purists believe it's an antidote to a fiat system. So I deal with that in Demise of the Dollar. But it's also uh, it's subject to the the throws of, of the boom bust cycle. We've seen Bitcoin go way up to sixty thousand and down to six thousand. It's in a cyclical period because um, it's a new in, uh, innovation being introduced in the market, um, and that's what we're going to see with AI. AI has been on a tear in the stock market all year. Uh, we're going to see bus, a big bust in that oh, yeah. coming at some point, too. So as new technology gets introduced into these different marketplaces and you have a flood of cash sitting around waiting to be deployed, uh, stock prices get bid up without any real intrinsic value behind them. Yeah. And that goes back all the way back. I start with the tulip bubbles and come all the way forward to uh, to the crypto craze in 2018. Yeah. So, so those are the books. <laughs> oh, I, I, that's why I brought them up, just um, people be aware of them. And um, so let's just have a quick, just before we wrap it up, I know you've got time, it's Thanksgiving that Eve in the USA, so I'm aware that um, you, you need to sit down with the family. So um, crypto, 
Uh, we've had a recovery in crypto because there's an inkling that it might end up being part of uh, normal, you know, exchanges and uh, so on. Where do you see crypto today, and where will, where do you think it's going? Uh, um, I, where I see it today is is what I was just describing. I think it's been the object of uh, immense amount of speculation. It's a really new technology. We started writing about Bitcoin in 2009. It's it's a decade old, really. And we've seen massive fortunes and failures in that amount of time. Um, we were just talking today. Today is the, the eve of Thanksgiving and Binance, which was the second largest uh, crypto exchange in the world um, behind FTX, both FTX and Binance uh, got went out of business and um, criminal and civil charges were filed against the, uh, the founders of both. Looks like Sam Bankman-Fried, SBF as he's known, uh, he's probably going to go to jail for, um, I don't know, I've heard up to 105 years. Uh, and then the guy CZ from uh, Binance um, just agreed to pay a $43 billion fine um, through his company as long as the company could stay open. And then he had to step down. So that's that's a feature of these booms and busts. You introduce technology, a new technology, a bunch of money flows in, all kinds of fraud and speculation happens. And then you have like you have your heroes and your villains. The story is it repeats itself uh, consistently throughout the financial, especially modern financial history in the West. Um, so I think that to me, at least as a writer anyway, that's the most interesting part of crypto up to this point is how it overlays onto the boom and bust cycle of um, uh, financial history perfectly. Uh, it's there are a ton of good stories to write about. There are interesting characters who do really foolish things, and you have like this kind of aura that somehow it's the the um, the currency of the future that's going to replace all paper currencies and, and whatever. So there's a lot of myth and legend and and uh, characters that go along with the story. What I do think, uh, and going back to the dot-com bus, what we were left over with after after all the fraud and speculation was dealt with in the 1998 to like the 2003 period, we were left with email, which has been a vastly uh, useful tool, led to things like Zoom, which we're talking on right now. Uh, everyone uses websites. The communication revolution was a real thing. It didn't necessarily necessarily materialize into um, the sort of digital utopia that everyone thought it was going to be, but it did introduce tools that are very useful and uh, most, um, at least, uh, Western society. And we don't we can't function without them. Mm. Um, I think the same thing is going to happen with crypto. It introduced blockchain, which is a vastly uh, superior, efficient tool for making transactions and guarding the privacy of those transactions. It's going to make um, banking much more efficient, which drives down the price. Um, there's a lot of benefits that we're going to see from just even the technology that makes cryptocurrencies possible, even if the currencies themselves don't end up being the, the solution to the fiat a uh, situation that we all find ourselves in. Um, the downside is that um, as we're seeing with the regulation of the of Binance and FTX, you, uh, there's regulators all over the world that can't wait to get their hands on cryptocurrencies and they're rapidly trying to use blockchain to develop uh, state or central bank controlled uh, digital currencies. Central bank digital currencies will give it's not only efficient for the banking system, but it's also going to be efficient for control of the currency of any given nation. And that's one of those, that's like AI. Once that genie is out of the, um, out of the, the bottle, we don't know what a, a government control over a currency in a digital space is going to look like. And that makes a lot of people nervous too. Hmm. Um, 
So I think it's it's just like AI, just like we were talking about AI. It's a feature that has a huge amount of potential, like the cryptocurrencies and the technology behind it have a huge amount of positive potential, but there's also a dark side that we should pay attention to as well. Yep. Yeah, it's um, any new technology brings its advantages and disadvantages. And um, in the end, we get left over with maybe the good bits and the bad bits, but um, I... Social media started out as this, you know, boom, and it's it's actually continued. But then there's also the dark side of social media, as in it creates uh, narcissism, it's creating depression in our, in our youth um, and anxiety, and uh, it's being used to create division amongst countries and politicians and society. So, but on the other hand, it still has distinct real um, advantages and uh, opportunities. So. Um, yeah, it's the truth lies somewhere in the middle, doesn't it? At the end of the day, and it's um, yeah. I think that I mean that's almost sounds like a lame way to end our conversation <laughs> because that that is true. Like there are good and bad sides to every piece of technology, and it's it's uh, beholden on us, the users, the end users, to understand how to um, to use it for positive uh, ends. Yep. And I think that that's one thing that we're, we're, at least in the U.S., I would say that we're sadly lacking is in w when new technology is interesting. We went through this with um, with dot coms or just the introduction of the Internet first, then social media, then cryptocurrency. Um, and now we're going to go through it with AI again is how poorly we educate new users to the benefits and the dangers. Like we do, our education system is way behind um, the average user. Their AI, we were talking about AI, there's gonna be an explosion of creativity. Is it gonna be good or bad? That's really up to the people that are, are employing it. And, uh, you know, having come from a, a studying philosophy in the Western canon, morality and ethics and all the things that they were talking about pre-Christian philosophy and in the Greek times and even some of the Latin uh, thinkers were worried about um, civic duty and those those kinds of things. We, we seem to have lost all that. Mm. Um, and I think it's important. We, it's much easier to convey those ideas online now than ever before. But um, I don't know. We need. We, I, I believe we need sort of a resurgence in interest in uh, civil society in a way that yep. we can both support and make more efficient because of technology, but also. Um, we should make it a, I don't, I don't even know how, I hate the word should because it implies that I have an answer of what we would do next, but um, it, it it is the natural guardrail to any of the dark side things creeping up with new technologies. Hmm. And I would say those, to me, those are the, the two most concerning things are AI, like how are people going to use it? And then also uh, the advent of um, CBDCs, uh, the central bank digital currencies. What it, what are governments going to do? What <laughs> I'm sure there's plenty of central bankers that would have like to have one digital currency for the entire world and be able to control it. The worst case scenario, like the, in the uh, dystopian sci-fi kind of aspect, would be that they could um, use social credit scores to decide whether you get to use your money the way you want to or not. Um, like they think you drink too much so that you can't go to the wine store and buy a bottle of wine, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, or, I mean, that's a pretty benign example, but there's a lot of things that they could decide they don't want you to have. Yeah. Um, and I don't think the technology exists for to tap into your buying patterns and stuff like that. But that's where the mind goes when you think of, of uh, sort of a centralized control of any kind of technology like that. Yeah. And that does become worrying. Yeah. Yep. So technology is good and it's bad. And uh, we it follows human behavior and amplifies it quite often. So, um, 
Yeah, I would say too that that's why I, that's another sort of driver of the work that I have been doing, and not by design, but just because it's what I'm most interested in. Um, we have the historical trends that lead up to where we are. We've been through booms and busts. We've been through fiat cycles and currency. We've been through political cycles and device, divisiveness, like we're seeing right now. We've we've seen this movie over and over again in history, um, and so understanding history and how to apply it to to events that are coming forward, or even tracking trends and seeing where they're likely to go, um, are really important. Yeah, they're because important I, for managing your own life, but also your investments in your finances and how you teach your children and all that kind of stuff. Well, hopefully we learn from history, but history shows that we don't. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's <awesome. laughs> so two quick questions to wrap it up. Um, number one, what brings, you know, Addison bliss? Um, if he had all the money in the world, what would Addison be doing every day that would bring him deep joy and happiness? It sounds like a, a lame answer. And you did give me a chance to think about this because you asked me before we started recording. <laughs> But I wouldn't really change much. I like what I do. I like reading. I like exploring ideas. I like writing about them. It's painful, and it it's not easy. Um, but I can't imagine doing anything else, even if I had. You know, I do do it for a living too. I want to get paid. Everybody wants to get paid. But um, this is what I would choose to do if, even if I had all the money in the world. Yeah, I've detected. I think um, you speak the truth. I think you are doing what brings you bliss, and um, it's great to see. And um, you're following Joseph Campbell's um, strategy or suggestion, which is great. The second question to wrap it up is: the human condition is not only filled with joy um, and happiness, but also there's suffering and pain as we go through life, the ups and downs. What's maybe the biggest lesson you've learned from tough times? Yes. Uh, um, I don't know if there's an overriding answer to that. I can think of specifics. Um, my hey, dad died. Like my dad died when I was uh, 24. Right. And I wish that I spent a lot more time with him than I did, but it, the period of time that I didn't spend with him, I was in my teens and I didn't care what my dad had to say or whatever. Yeah. So, I mean, there's like periods of loss that teach you things that you can't understand until you've been through it. I've had a couple businesses that have failed because I had the wrong idea or I didn't treat people the right way or, or like whatever. I mean, I, there are specific reasons why different things didn't work the way I wanted them to. Um, mm. So I, those are painful experiences too. Like, mm. I don't know. There's, there are things that I have learned from trying to, it's like the extension of trying to get yourself out there in the world. And, mm. and uh, I don't know, in a banal way, just sell your product, which is your productivity of the things that you produce. Um, that teaches you a lot about yourself and the way that you interact with other people. And then I think that another one is, um, is uh, at least something I've learned is honesty is like, is probably paramount to any other thing when it comes to relationships with other people. Right. Um, and I violated that enough times where I think that that is probably one of the most important things that I would, I try to teach my kids and uh, and I try to totally to up to you. Mm. I think I detected a common theme through all of that answer is that the importance of human relationships. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's, it is what it is. <laughs> that's yeah. what it's all about, really. So, Addison, thank you very much for sharing your insights, your wisdom, and your life stories. Uh, I've learned a lot, and it's been an absolute joy to have a conversation about uh, writing. Yeah, thank you. 
Yeah, thank you for having me on because I don't feel like I have to expound on uh, any of my philosophies of the world to the Thanksgiving table anymore. <laughs> Not at all out. <laughs> well, have a great Thanksgiving and um, enjoy the time with the family. And thank you very much for um, sharing your thoughts with me and uh, with the world. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.